Good evening and welcome. Welcome everyone to this live telephone town hall meeting we have for you tonight with your Congressman Ralph Norman. We had a few folks dial in early on our inbound participant line. Want to thank you all so much for being on time and prompt. If you are just joining, I'd like to say good evening and welcome. Welcome everyone to this live telephone town hall meeting we have for you tonight with your Congressman Ralph Norman. Tonight we are dialing out to tens of thousands of homes right here in the 5th District of South Carolina. Again, hello and welcome. If you're just joining, you're live on the line with your Congressman, Ralph Norman. We do these calls as a way to reach out to you and open up the conversation. Tonight we'll hear an update from Congressman Norman and then we'll get right to your questions live. If you would like to join our conversation tonight with your question, comment, or concern, please press zero on the keypad on your phone. Again, to get in line with your question, please press zero on the keypad on your phone. We'll be taking your questions live during this event, but if you'd rather not go live, that's fine. Still press zero, get your question in line. Just let your operator know you'd rather not go live, and I'd be happy to read your question over the air. Again, if you are just joining the call, I'd like to say good evening. Hello, you are live on the line with Congressman Ralph Norman. We're dialing out to tens of thousands of neighbors right here in South Carolina's 5th District tonight, so please bear with me as I go through this intro. Again, you're live on the line with Congressman Ralph Norman. He has a guest tonight, Kathy Rose Hicklin, the Director of Casework for Rep Norm Representative Norman's Congressional Office, who is here to answer constituent service issue questions. A reminder to get in line with your question and speak directly with Congressman Ralph Norman or Kathy Rose Hicklin, press zero on the keypad on your phone. Also tonight, we're collecting your email addresses. Email is one of the best ways for us to keep you up to date on the issues we're discussing tonight, as well as other important issues going forward. To provide your email address, please press seven on the keypad on your phone. Again, that is zero on the keypad on your phone to submit your question, and seven to provide us your email address to get the very latest from Congressman Norman's office. So I'll just remind everyone one more time before turning this over to Congressman Norman himself, press zero on the keypad on your phone to get in line with your question, comment, or concern, and press seven on the keypad on your phone so we can keep you up to date with very important issues going forward from Congressman Norman's office. All right, it is now my pleasure to get our call officially started off by turning this over to Congressman Ralph Norman. Sir, please take it away. I want to thank everybody uh, for taking the time to join. This is weird, a very crucial time in the history of our great country. And let me just tell you, I, I feel strongly as your congressman that I owe you three basic things from the outset. One, inform you on bills that will be before this Congress uh, that I'll be voting on and informing you on what is in the legislation so that you will know the facts and can make your own decisions. Secondly, where I stand on the facts and why I support or oppose the legislation. Thirdly, listen to your concerns and solicit your opinions. Uh, you know, and the bottom line is that way too often politicians just tell you what they oppose. And they don't tell you what they're for. I'm going to tell you what I'm for tonight. And at the end, I will give you a blueprint of what I would suggest. All right, first of all, let's go over some legislative issues that I will be voting on. Uh, the, the latest one is a COVID spending bill that's under consideration. Congress has already appropriated $4 trillion in COVID spending. This is money we don't have, folks. There's no piggy bank that they're getting this. Of that $4 trillion, more than $1 trillion has not even been spent. But Congress is now considering another $1.9 trillion package that uh, is in addition to all that I've just named. Remember, this is on top of the federal government's normal spending, uh, which sadly there's no offset or effort to uh, obtain financial uh, security for our country. Everything keeps piling on to our existing debt, of, of $28 trillion. We sim simply cannot afford to do this. Uh, furthermore, this is really too much wasteful spending. Uh, and let me just give you some unrelated to COVID items that are in this bill. $58 billion for pension bailouts, $195 billion to bail out state governments. 
many which have been set which have been shut down because of uh, liberal legislatures and governors. 155 billion for local governments, territories, and tribes. 40 billion for colleges and universities. 28 billion for transit agencies in various cities around the nation. Uh, I could go on and on, but that's just a few that are in this bill. Uh, of the 130 billion in the bill for the K-12 schools, only 5 percent would be spent in this fiscal year. Of the 5 billion for emergency housing vouchers, only 5 percent would be spent in this year. Of the 39 billion for child care, only 19 percent would be spent. Of the 50 billion for FEMA, only 23 percent would be spent. And of the five uh, billion for homeless assistance, none of it will be spent this fiscal year. Uh, you know, I want to thank, uh, in part, President Trump's Operation Warp Speed. We have vaccines long before critics thought they would be available. The average time is seven years to develop a vaccine. We did it in less than a year, and we involved the private sector. Uh, we now have declining hospitalizations, and deaths in most parts of the nation are, are lowering. We have light at the end of the tunnel toward the summer and the fall months. All of this is good news. So to the extent Congress needs to pass additional relief, uh, it should be necessary, targeted, and well-defined. The $1.9 trillion bill is none of those, so I'll be voting against this when it comes up in the House. Uh, next, I'm getting a lot of questions about our Second Amendment rights. Everyone on this call should know exactly where I stand on this issue. I am pro-Second Amendment, and I will oppose any effort to infringe upon our right to bear arms, which is under attack. There's a bill in Congress, it's H.R. 127, that was introduced by Congressman Sheila Jackson Lee, uh, and it's basically just an outlandish attempt that violates our Second Amendment rights. Uh, it's not before the House now, but if it comes up, I'll be voting against it. Now, let's move on to some of the executive orders that President Biden has issued in the first few weeks in office. Let's start with immigration. I'm getting some questions about the U.S. Citizenship Act of 2021. This is a liberal proposal that would ultimately create a pathway to citizenship, a pathway to citizenship for 11 million, and I would suggest it's far more than that, uh, illegal immigrants, uh, among other things. It's not just something that I cannot, I can support. Uh, the other concern uh, for me is executive orders that President Biden has issued on the immigration issue. He's issued uh, an executive order on February 4th that will increase asylums in our country from 15,000 to 125,000. Before that, on February 2nd, he rescinded a rule that President Trump established that required immigrants to repay the government if they receive public benefits. Uh, he rescinded that. Last month, he ended construction of the border wall by terminating the declaration used to fund it. Uh, he put a hold on most deportations of people uh, who have active deportation orders. Bottom line, folks, Biden is inviting people across the border by refusing to enforce our immigration laws. Uh, as a result, border agents are now arresting around 3,000 people per day trying to enter this country illegally. Uh, last month, encounters at the border are up 114% from the same time last year. I think we're in for a rough ride when it comes to the uh, uh, impact of illegal immigration. And now that uh, President Biden's in office, he's doing it by executive order. Once these people illegally come into country, folks, there's no way to track them. And it's just going to add to our prisons. It's going to add to the 140-some uh, programs that they can get uh, get uh, put in line for. And uh, we, the taxpayers, we as Americans, should not have to put up with that. Another executive order that President Biden issues, he halted the Keystone XL pipeline. Uh, Canada is an ally with us on crude oil. Uh, despite efforts to move away from the fossil fuels, it's going to take decades to get there. Uh, until then, our nation needs oil and to survive and prosper. This means for the greater good of all Americans, we need efficient ways to get crude oil from Canada to our mid Midwestern and Gulf Coast refineries. The Keystone Pipeline was meant to help supply part of our nation's future energy needs. Uh, but what this president has done is wipe out thousands of job, jobs. He's harmed the future uh, supply of our U.S. energy, and he's uh, insulted Canada and made it clear that climate activism 
uh, will dominate his administration. So when you go to the pump tomorrow to fill up, you're going to notice a, a pretty good substantial increase. That's because this president has eliminated our energy independence and the fact that under President Trump we were exporting the number one exporter of oil and natural gas has come to a stop. And we're going to be dependent on countries that don't like us to get our oil and natural gas. It makes no sense. Uh, on another topic, we can't lose sight of what's happening on the international stage. China and Russia continue to be a thorn in our side. Uh, Representative Joe Wilson and I had a big win earlier this week when the University of South Carolina decided to close this Confucius Institute, which operated under the influence of the communist Chinese government. As you've already heard about, uh, the solar wind cybersecurity attack uh, and what we're finding out, it was carefully planned. It was highly sophisticated attack by government-sponsored hackers from Russia and most likely China as well. Uh, with this new, China, new Congress, I'm serving on the subcommittee on cybersecurity on the House Committee on Homeland Security. I will try to keep you informed on the threats that we're facing, which I can tell you are pretty severe. Uh, now, as we look over the next six to nine months, uh, a big focus – for me, is how we can help restore our economy back to full speed. Uh, I will support uh, anything that has an impact on business, which, of course, is to create jobs in South Carolina as well as the whole nation. Um, now, on, on things that I feel strongly about and things that uh, I think we need to be activated on, uh, I feel like that getting children back in school ought to be a top priority. Now, how do you do that? You get into groups. You go to the school boards and you say, we need our children back to school. This is what you're paying taxes for. This is uh, why uh, you need to insist, open the schools back up. It's been over a year since we found this, va this vaccine, I mean, this uh, horrible pandemic affected America. Now it's, it's time to go back to school for our children and not let them suffer anymore. I think we need to get very active on pay raises for our law enforcement. Uh, we're a nation of laws, and you hear the law enforcement being denigrated. Now's the time to pay them. Uh, now's the time to have a, ra a pay raise. In 2019, in South Carolina, the General Assembly gave judges and solicitors a pay raise. It's time now for our law enforcement to get a pay raise. What do you do? You get involved. You get, get people, uh, and you go to your city councils, and you go to your state legislators and say, we want uh, raises for our law enforcement. Most of our law enforcement agencies are running short on people anyway. Uh, I think we need to band together on the, where, on the National Chamber of Commerce, who has supported a lot of candidates that were not for business. They were supported candidates that uh, would, would jeopardize our right to work here in South Carolina. We need to let our, our local chambers know they need to write a letter to the Chamber of Commerce say, telling them that they shouldn't, shouldn't support candidates that are going to destroy our great businesses here in South Carolina. Uh, voter integrity. I'm looking at several counties within uh, South Carolina that we've had voter issues. I'm going to take them up one by one. I need some people to help on the research part of it. Uh, and that's where you can call our office at 803-327-1114. Uh, uh, and I'll repeat this later on. And finally, folks, you need to, to volunteer for events uh, for where we the people have a voice. We've lost our the, – the conservatives have lost our voice while the left – is is voicing their opinion, which we don't have to put up with, we don't have to agree with, but we need to have our voices be heard. If it's if it's ever a time for we the people uh, to get involved uh, on the issues that I've just raised, that's what we need to do. Now, I'm more interested in hearing answering your questions and uh, getting to whatever you have. So there's no question I will not take, uh, and don't have a t hesitate to leave a voicemail at the conclusion of this program. Reach out to my congressional office by going online to norman.house.gov. With that, Allison, let's go to our first question. Excellent. Thank you so much for that update, Congressman. First question is Kathy before Inez. Mark, great questions. Keep them coming by pressing zero on the keypad on your phone. Kathy, in York, you're live right now. Please go ahead with your question. Oh, thank you. Um, and 
and thank you for letting me um, come on. It is um, voter um, election integrity, and I, you know, we've heard the horror stories in other states how they went in through the back door and they changed their laws. And I want to know what we can do to make sure we stay on the straight and narrow. And you- well, let me, great question, Kathy. Let me first of all tell you what HR one does. One, it puts the federal government in charge of our elections. Uh, they they have a six to one match. If you give two hundred dollars to a candidate, the government will match twelve hundred dollars. Now that makes no sense. They take away our right to buy boundaries for our congressional district. They take away the uh, voter ID. You can basically just uh, say who you are and not have any way to uh, to validate that. That's flat out wrong. It makes it so politicians can get a salary off of the campaign donations. Uh, and all, electri- all elections are local. Uh, the people decide elections. Now, what can you do? Um, well, luckily, your delegation is going to, you know, the majority of our delegation is going to vote opposing this because if this, if HR one passes, we will not win another election. Conservatives won't. So, uh, we're in South Carolina. Uh, of the seven, six of us are, are going to vote against it. But now, what you need to do is. Uh, everybody has connections to other states. Everybody has families in other areas. Uh, anybody that uh, – and, and all you Democrats are uh, pretty much are in lockstep on this bill. If you know somebody uh, in another state that has a that, – that is in a district where a congressman is going to vote for H.R. 1, call them up and tell them to write them and try to meet with them because uh, that's the American way. That's how you get involved. But luckily in South Carolina, you know, we're going to vote against it. It's just we're one vote. There are 435 congressmen. And uh, I'm as upset about this bill as I am uh, just about anything I've seen. It's far left. It's radical. And we've got to stop it. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Congressman. Thanks, Kathy, for joining up our conversation tonight. Next up, we have Inez right away from Clover. Inez, you are live. Please go ahead with your question. Yes, good evening, uh, Congressman Norman. Um, You answered my question, so I'm going to pose another one. Why is the fence still up in Washington, D.C.? Why why is the fence still around the Capitol building? All right, well, let me me tell you, Inez, these are my thoughts. Uh, Nancy Pelosi thinks that uh, there's a danger of those of us in Congress doing uh, doing bad things to other congressmen, and that she primarily thinks Republicans are going to do something to the to the Democrats. Now, the Democrats, if if you remember, don't think fences work. That's why they don't think the wall works. Uh, so I think uh, we, we we've got a hearing on it tomorrow. But I don't. I think it's a fear factor. Uh, I think. We're trying to find out why, what, what made her put this fence up, who's paying for it, what threats do we have that uh, puts her so much in danger. And the Speaker of the House has got all the power. Um, you know, they just the, – the, the, she controls the committee. She controls pretty much everything, including the security around the Capitol. So uh, we hopefully will find out. I have no idea. We're having to go through the magnetometers uh, to make sure we don't carry guns or we don't uh, uh, carry knives and jump on fellow congressmen. It's absurd. It's a fear factor. I resent it, and um, hopefully we're going to be able to get to the bottom of it. Excellent. Thanks so much. Thanks, Inez, for joining our conversation. Next up, we have Mark before Rudolph, Suzanne, Janice. Great questions tonight. Mark in Rock Hill, you're live. Please go ahead. Hi, Congressman. I have a couple of questions. I know that uh, uh, you've talked about being a good budget hawk, uh, deficit hawk, but at the same time, you have signed off on everything that President Trump has agreed to. Uh, Also, you complain about Biden's executive orders, but you still uh, never complained about Trump's executive orders. And third, you hire illegals. (laughs) Uh, Mark, give me an example of the items that are wrong that Trump put up that spending. Give me uh, you're making these broad claims. Trump 
uh, try to eliminate illegals coming in, which is going to bankrupt this country. Uh, Trump did have spending, but he did it for areas law enforcement. He did it for things that uh, he cut regulations. You're wrong on your question. Uh, I am a budget hawk, and uh, uh, we still got to get back to offsets, but you're wrong about Trump. This country, under four years with as much headwinds as Donald Trump had, did a great job uh, in spending. Uh, he, he inherited a budget that Obama had, which was just uh, spending out of the uh, off the moon. Uh, and what this what uh, uh, Biden is taking it to a new level, unfortunately. But I will put my record up against anybody's, and you're just wrong on your assumptions. <clears throat> Excellent. Thanks so much, Congressman. Thanks, Mark, for joining our conversation tonight. Right away, we have Rudolph in Prosperity. Rudolph, you're live on the line. We have a bunch of questions behind you, so do your best to keep it short. All right. Thank you. Uh, Representative Irwin, I, I hope you and your family are doing well today. Uh, later this week, you will be given the opportunity uh, to help many of us in your congressional district. President Biden's $1.9 trillion relief package will be voted on. It will provide an additional $1,400 to each person making less than $75,000 a year. It will increase the weekly unemployment compensation $100 and extend that comp comp uh, compensation till September uh, for those who were laid off due to the COVID-19 pandemic. It will also provide health coverage for those who lost their employer's health coverage due to COVID-19. It will also increase the minimum wage and, and provide additional funding for uh, COVID-19 vaccines and testing. I ask okay. you, will you yes on this bill that will provide the much needed help and relief for all of us here in your district? Okay, Rudolph, thank you. Thank you for your question. <clears throat> well, let, let me tell you what this COVID bill does. It says it's for COVID. Less than 9% of the $1.9 trillion we actually go for, uh, go for combating COVID. Less than 9%. <clears throat> it's named after COVID, but uh, it's got some horrible things in there, like uh, Ms. Pelosi uh, has got $100 million for a San Francisco subway. What does that have to do with COVID? Nothing. It'll cut 1.4 million jobs by increasing the minimum wage by 107%. Uh, it's got other uh, pet projects. I think it's got $430 billion for local governments in states that vote Democratic. Now, I, and, and let me tell you this, Rudolph, uh, and, and a, a person called me not long ago and, and asked me about the same thing, and I said, well, let me ask you this. Would you take a pill that did have some good things in it, but 91% uh, of what was in the pill was going to kill you? And he said, no. I said, well, that's how this COVID bill is. Uh, the majority of it's bad, and uh, I can't support something that's going to bankrupt this country. And that's what this bill does. Uh, and it's a ruse to say it's COVID because I can't see how a, um, a, a rail that Ms. Pelosi has has to do anything with anything with COVID, along with trillions of other dollars that, uh, that do. Thank you for the question, though. Thanks, Rudolph, for joining our conversation. Next up, we have Suzanne before Janice, Helen, Jen. Great questions, but want to remind everyone you can press 7 on the keypad on your phone to provide us your email address. That is a great way for us to keep you up to date going forward on issues we're discussing tonight, as well as other issues going forward. So pressing 7 on the keypad on your phone so that you can get the latest from Congressman Ralph Norman's office right to your inbox. All right, Suzanne in Grassney, you are live right now. Please go ahead with your question. Hello, Congressman Norman. How you doing? Um, I hey, I'm good. How are you? Doing great. Good. Yeah, I have a couple questions too, and uh, I kind of want to play off a of Rudolph's thing. Um, I think the bill's bad. Um, like you said, it has a lot of junk in it. Um, I don't. I, I, anyway, I do sound like an idiot, but I guess my my number one question is: Is there a timeline for when? Our country will open up. 
Well, we've been fortunate in South Carolina that, uh, unlike North Carolina with Governor Cooper, he's basically shut the, shut the state down. Governor McMaster has done a good job of leaving, uh, letting South Carolina businesses open. Uh, you know, this is something this this pandemic has affected this country since uh, over a year, year and two months now. Uh, we're just now getting to the cause of, of treating it with the vaccine, and I think the precautions that we're taking are similar to what Florida's doing, letting businesses open up. You wear, you take the precautions. You're, we're getting the vaccines, and the best thing we can do in this country is open up all the states. Uh, but some of the worst-run states by Democrats are uh, where they just shut it down, and, and you got bureaucrats, politicians, telling businesses to shut down. The oxygen uh, for any business is to, you know, to to apply your trade, to produce your product, and to pay the taxes that keep the local government running. And I'll remind a lot of our big government friends: the states created the federal go- federal government, not vice versa. And a lot of times we forget that, and we we don't look to the states to bail us out. But the number one thing we can do across the country is they need to do like South Carolina and open it up for business. Couldn't agree more. Thank you so much, Representative. Thanks, Suzanne. Great questions tonight. All right, up next we have Janice in Union City. Janice, you are live right now. Please go ahead with your question. Hi, Representative Norman. Thank you so much for doing Kelly Town Halls. Um, Due to the January 6th invasion of the Capitol, police officers are now manning the metal detectors as part of the beefed-up security in the Capitol. And it's been reported you walked around these metal detectors instead of submitting to the security. And I'm glad to hear you say tonight that you now go through the metal detectors that since there's been a $5,000 fine imposed. Um, My question then is, did your office staff at the Capitol assist visitors to gain access to the U.S. Capitol in the days prior to the January 6th invasion? Did my office staff assist people to come into the Capitol? Uh, we had people visiting. I'm trying to think who they were, but uh, the day of the of the uh, riot, I was in the Capitol voting, and. Uh, I'm sure days before we had people coming in, but the Capitol's pretty much been shut down anyway because of COVID. So we haven't had our normal, unfortunately, hadn't had our normal people that could could see the Capitol, as well as all the other buildings around uh, Washington, D.C., which are great to see. Uh, but uh, but no, I, uh, I'm sure we had some lobbyists and different people coming in but and staff, but for the most part, the Capitol's been shut down. Uh, as far as going through the the uh, magnetometers, it's crazy. It's a fear factor that Ms. Pelosi is doing. The uh, she's erected a wall to supposedly protect from outsiders, and I guess she's scared of of her fellow congressmen, you know, hurting her. But this is a this is a lady, and a lot of Democratic colleagues do not believe in walls. They believe in sanctuary cities. That they don't cooperate with the police. <clears throat> they believe in defunding the police, which is diametrically opposite what I believe. We need to fund the police more, and uh, I'm pushing for that, uh, in, in particularly in South Carolina, and I hope other congressmen will do the same thing. Thank you so much, Representative. Thanks, Janice, for joining our conversation. Before we go to Helen next, uh, Congressman, I want to just pause here and have you repeat your website again for everyone, and then tell everyone your social media, how everyone can follow you online. Sure. Yeah, you can all, for all your listeners, you can follow me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Rep Ralph Norman. Uh, also, be sure to, to visit my website, sign up for my email updates at norman.house.gov. And let me give you the number for our office, 803-327-1114. Excellent. Thank you so much. All right. Right away, let's go to Helen in York. Helen, you are live. Please go ahead with your question. Um, I would like to uh, know if you have any idea uh, when uh, we will can expect our stimulus check or are we going to get it? There's so many people needing it, using it for good things like paying bills, uh, groceries, doctor bills. 
it's not just for the ones that that just blows it because they got it for free. And yeah, Ellen, let me. Can, uh, yeah, let me. Let me. I'm gonna call on Kathy Rose, but uh, long and short, IRS is is super backlogged. Uh, Kathy Rose, you want to uh, brief Helen on sure. that? Sure. Um, sure. And Helen, are you, are you speaking of the twelve hundred dollars stimulus check, the six hundred, or the proposed legislation? And the the fourteen hundred. That's what I thought you were talking about. Um, that has not been enacted into law yet. So until that bill is signed and until that amount is agreed upon. I, I don't have any kind of timeline. Hey, Kathy Rose, All right, excellent. The, the the backlog on the uh, for this is unbelievable. But once it get, I think you're looking probably uh, weeks, if not months, before that gets passed. Right. Uh, but um, it, it's just well, it'll take a. Sure, I, and Helen, to give you an idea, um, for example, with the six hundred dollar uh, stimulus check. Once that was signed into law by President Trump on the 30th of December of 2020, um, by law, Congress had and United States Treasury had five days to start printing and distributing those checks. So, for example, that proposed legislation is coming up for um, a vote, maybe. Friday, Saturday, maybe it won't, but not until that is voted into law by Congress will we know when that $1,400 stimulus check you're talking about might be distributed by the United States Treasury Department. I wish I had a better answer. Um, I, I just don't know. It, it depends on when it, it is voted and signed into law. Excellent. Great information. Thank you so much, Kathy Rose. And that's the Director of Casework right here in Rep. Norman's Congressional Office. Thanks so much for that great question, Helen. Let's go to Jim next before Marshall. Jim in Charlotte, you are live right now. Please go ahead with your question. Hello, Congressman. Um, I was reviewing your, your voting record um, concerning environmental matters uh, going back a few years. And I was unable to identify a single vote that you cast uh, in favor of protecting the environment um, on endangered species, climate change, uh, whether our public lands are open to exploitation, air and water pollution. Um, you voted in favor of expedited destruction in every single instance. I could not find an exception. And your comments earlier on this call expressing support for burning Canadian tar sand oil for another generation appears to be another illustration of this, this problem that you have with our earth. Now, as someone whose children will be living upon this earth in the future, I, I take this rather personally, and I would like an explanation from you uh, respectfully, sir. Yeah, thank, thank you, Jim. Appreciate the question. Uh, well, first of all, the uh, you know I'm co-chair of the Congressional Solar Caucus. Uh, I'm a big proponent of solar energy. Uh, that's that's market generated, not government generated. The pro problem with the Green New Deal is uh, promoted by AOC, which uh, I think her background is in tending bar. Uh, but what she wants to do is have a government run, uh, government run system where pretty much everything comes to a halt. She thinks the earth is going to end in 12 years. Uh, and you and I are just going to have to agree to disagree on this. Uh, I'm for uh, clean air. I'm for clean water. Uh, but I think there is a – we've got natural resources in, in this country that President Trump, uh, you know, put this country first. We're, we're energy independent for the first time. In 50-some years, we exported clean oil and natural gas. Now we're going to be defended, dependent on foreign countries uh, that uh, particularly don't like us. I think your children and, and my children are going to get a wake-up call when they're paying 4 and $5 for gas. I don't think that's going to work out too well for you or me. 
But uh, no, I uh, I'm proud of my my record. I stand on it. Uh, and as far as the you know the 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 future for your children, going with this administration, the Biden administration, we're going to be bankrupt, and it won't be a country to really um, to to sustain us. You can't spend more than you make. And for what this what the, this administration is is off the tracks on is thinking we're going to end the the world's going to end in ten or twelve years, and that uh, we spend money we don't have to give to groups that don't have our best interests at heart. So we just have to agree to disagree on that. Thank you so much, Jim, for joining our conversation. Let's go right away to Marshall before Denise and David. And Jason, Marshall, and Clover, you are live right now. Please go ahead with your question. Uh, Congressman, uh, I do have a couple questions to ask you very quickly. Uh, you had, uh, you have, uh, yeah, I have legislation uh, on term limits that you put forth, uh, and you said it will be uh, two, th- uh, excuse me, three two-year terms for uh, congressmen and two six-year terms for senators. You are now into your second uh, term. And at the very beginning, you said whether this is passed or not, that you would limit your own term itself. What are your plans in regards to that? I assume you're going to run in 2022, and uh, I make the assumption that you will also uh, win for your third term. Yeah, let me tell you, term limits is something that, uh, and and I could care less. People that argue with me on term limits uh, say, well, you know, what's the number term? What's the number of years? I said six years uh, for House members, and uh, twelve years for senators. Uh, for you know, the two six-year terms. So uh, yeah, I'm all for that. If it ends up, uh, if it ends up for House members, uh, a People want to to increase that to you know eight years. I just when you're 80 years old, you shouldn't be ser- serving in Congress uh, if you've been here 20, 30 years. That goes for Republicans. It goes for Democrats. And I think that's the right thing to do. And my age is going to limit me. But if it ends up, uh, I'll judge each year. But you know, I got it. I, I'm not a career politician. I didn't get in this when I was as Joe Biden did. Uh, when he's in his 20s and serves 47 years, that's wrong. Uh, you, when you're a pilot, you've got, I think it's 65 that you have to stop flying planes. Surgeons quit in the 60s. So, uh, you know, I think to get this country back uh, in, in, in a financial position and get this country back to what the founders intended, you go up and serve a short time and come home. Um, so that's what I, I, I agree with, and uh, that's what I will end up doing. Thank you so much, Congressman. Thanks so much, Marshall. So glad to have you join our conversation tonight. Next up, let's get to Denise in Rock Hill. Denise, I know you have a lot of questions, but we still have a lot of people behind you. So try to pick your one most important question. Okay. Thank you, Congressman Norman, for letting me call. My most immediate important one is... Janice, I can barely hear you. Uh, Can you hear me now? Yes, ma'am. Okay. I'm a healthcare worker. I have worked through this COVID vaccine, long hours and everything. I am being told that because I'm not going to take the COVID vaccine, I am going to lose my job. Is there going to be any type of gray area to protect nurses and healthcare workers that choose not to take the vaccine? We wear the PPE, we've stood by, we've helped families, and now we're being told that if we don't take a vaccine, we're going to lose our jobs. I mean, we've well, been out there. Well, Janice, I, one, I think whether you take the vaccine or not, that's your your choice. No government shouldn't make you take it. Now, if your employer is saying that your job's threatened, then you need to take that up with them. them. Uh, and there's a lot of precautions that people are taking now that have not taken the vaccine. This is the first time I've heard, you know, that, that – you know, uh, that employers are going to fire you if you don't take it. I guess you just have to take that up with them. But I'm a strong believer is if if you want to take the vaccine, you take it. If you don't, you don't. Different people respond differently. 
uh, and you know I'm fine wearing the mask, uh, and which we're doing here. Uh, but I think with with what we've learned about the vaccine, that a lot of precautions that make make sense are, are being done now. Uh, and we can't stay shut down forever. I, long story short, I would take it up with your employer and, uh, and, and you know, go over it with them because every employer is different. And this is the first I've heard that somebody uh, will let, you know, are, are going to fire you if you don't. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Denise. So glad to have you on the call. Thanks, Congressman. Next up, we have Paul before David and Jason. Paul in Fort Mill, you are live right now. Please go ahead with your question. Um, hi, Representative Norman. Thank you for um, taking my call. Of course, it's sure. Um, I, I'm watching the news now with frustration as I see um, the Democrats and liberals take away all of our gains, our energy independence, our tough stand to China, our America First immigration policies, our Second Amendment rights through their executive orders and their fancy name bills that they're pushing through. I also watched when Trump was president, the Democrats resist, sue, and delay everything that we try to do that was worthwhile for conservatives. Um, Kevin McCarthy was on TV this weekend, and his response to what can we do was, call your congressman. Well, I want to know what specifically can the Republicans do to stop this radical agenda from being passed? And um, if the Republicans can't do it, can't stop this, who do we look to to do this? Thank you, Paul. Appreciate your question. Well, it just goes to the importance that, you know, we are who we put in office. Uh, you know, the way we stop this radical agenda, you defeat candidates that side with what the Democrats are trying to do. We're only five short. Uh, we were in the 30s back when I started the 116th Congress. We're five short. What I'm going to do is get active in defeating uh, these liberal socialists who are passing the kind of legislation that they're doing. Now, they've got the votes now with Ms. Pelosi. Uh, you know, she sets the committees there. We have no power to stop it because they have the votes. But we've got to get the gavel away from her. And the way we do that is beat those candidates. Uh, you go after every liberal uh, every liberal candidate that, that, that sides with this socialistic agenda. And, folks, uh, I'm concerned about us losing our republic. I will tell you, with, with the steps that this president has taken, uh, I'm concerned that not only is he, you know, y'all have watched the, the when he leaves the when he has an executive order, he answers no question. You've got questions from the media. The media has no curiosity on what he's doing, and so we've got to get the people that that in Congress, uh, which you know, every two years we elect Congress, get let's pick up the five votes, and uh, and get. Uh, conservatives back in in office, take the gavel away from her, and we'll stop these executive orders because uh, we'll vote them. Well, we can't stop the executive orders, but the passage of HR one and some of this environmental uh, hullabaloo that's going on, we'll stop it from ever passing. And the bottom line is, get involved and get active, and do your research on those that are voting to support this socialistic agenda, and we'll stop it. Excellent. Thanks so much, Congressman. Thanks, Paul, for joining our conversation. Next up, we have David. But before we go to David, I want to do a last call for email addresses. Last call if you'd like to press 7 on the keypad on your phone to provide us your email address so that we can keep you up to date and you can get the very latest from Congressman Norman's office. So press 7 right now on the keypad on your phone so you have enough time to grab your email address before the end of the forum. All right, David, you are live right now. Please go ahead with your question. Hello, Congressman Norman. Um, my question is, several years ago, they did the caller ID to prevent the unwanted solicitation calls, but 
the clever people have figured out a way around that, and you get these calls marked private with no number. You get the spoofing calls that they use your neighbor or your good friend's name and number to call you, and then you get these numbers that are not um, – numbers that are in use, but they're calling from that number. So then when you call it back, that number is no longer in service. So how did you just receive a telephone call from a number that is no longer in service? That's more invasive to me than the Mexicans coming over from Mexico because that invades my home every day. Every time they call, that's invading my home. Yeah, but David, let, let me mention this to you. Uh, they have found a way around to, to beat the caller ID. I haven't heard of a any method to stop it. But now, if that's your biggest concern, if you really think uh, getting nu- nuisance phone calls outweighs letting anybody come into this country, uh, let them get registered to vote, let them take part in our school systems, uh, have an open door of criminals, of drug cartels. If you think that's gr- a greater threat, then I just um, we're going to have to I disagree with you. Uh, it is, you know, I get the same calls you do. I don't answer them. A lot of times it pops up on my phone, spam risk. I don't answer it. And if if I do answer it, I hang up pretty quick if it's trying to sell me something or if it's something I'm not interested in. But uh, anyway, I think we got pressing issues uh, that I would get, that I would, I guess, look at. And I think, uh, you know, the, the, the illegals and what this liberal group is trying to do with our voting security, basically taking it away, far outweighs a phone call. Absolutely. Thanks so much, sir. Thanks so much, David. So glad to have you on our call tonight. Up next, we have Jason in Fort Mill. Jason, you're live. Please go ahead with your question. Uh, Congressman Norman, first of all, thank you for your service, and thank you for staring down the left and trying to keep them in check. Because if someone's got to do it, it might as well be you. Um, (laughs) Thank you. So as it relates to COVID, you know, with all this money, and we know the virus, you know, it came from China, as President Trump would say, it's a China virus. Um, Is there any way we can send them a debit memo or get a credit for all this money? That's my first question, and I have a follow-up. Is there any is there any um, plans on getting this infrastructure bill passed this year, potentially? But Jason, let me ask you first question. As far as getting a uh, a check back from China with Joe Biden, he's a compromised candidate uh, in the first place. Uh, the money that his son got, he he received. I wish I could say that he would have some, uh, some, I guess, a spine to get it back, uh, and but I don't think so. Uh, had President Trump been elected, yes, they would have paid a price, and they should pay a price. I think uh, we're all going to find more out about how this virus got here, and the fact that I, I think we will find out there's there's a lot of politics that were played with this virus, but time will tell. Um, so. You know, I have no hopes that Biden is going to do anything on that because uh, he's a he's a compromised candidate. Um, what was your other question? If there's any, uh, does it have any leg on the infrastructure bill this year or for next year? Again, I wish I could say yes, but uh, the only infrastructure bill these Democrats have put up, if it benefits their liberal cities, if it benefits the labor unions. If it benefits the Governor Cuomo's of New York and the the, uh, the Newsoms in California, they play hardball like this, and that's the that's the downside of electing people like this. Uh, so, if, if it's if if it's under President Trump, he would put some checks and balances on it. He would put it where cities and counties had to have some equity in the deal <coughs> before they could uh, get a check. Under Pelosi and under Chuck Schumer, no. It's I wouldn't vote for an infrastructure bill coming from those two. Uh, it, it 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 would be amazing if they came up with anything that's fair. Nothing else they've done has been fair, and I don't expect anything else on that uh, that would be fair coming from this administration. 
Absolutely. Thank you so much, sir. Thanks so much, Jason, for joining our conversation. Up next, let's get Bill in Fort Mill. Bill, you're live. Please go ahead with your question. Hi. I have a, hey, first of all, I'm very happy you are our rep- representative. You're doing a great job. I, I, I believe in you about 100%. I can't believe this. Uh, unfortunately, I, the rest of the country, I don't agree with them, and I especially don't agree with Joe Biden. I think he's trying to destroy America. A lot of people are saying, well, he's the third term for Obama. Uh, it's just horrible. But I like you, but how? what can we do to fix the rest of the country? It's a, it's a disaster. All right. Well, one thing, uh, Bill, that, that I would say we – I, that I would I strongly believe in. We've got to fix it. Uh, the voting laws in this country that were changed after Donald Trump got elected. The five states that uh, went around the Constitution and uh, did away with voter ID. They had mass mail-in ballots, no verification. Uh, you know, extended voter deadlines. I'm sorry, uh, that should not have been tolerated. And I think we would have had a different outcome had we had different, uh, had we had a fair election, which I don't think took place. So we fix that. And that's why I mentioned at the, at the onset, I'm gonna fix uh, or try to explore some some fraud that went on in South Carolina. Granted, uh, I don't think it was that much. But my question to anybody that says there's voter fraud everywhere, my question back is, well, how much is acceptable? You stop bad behavior, and I'm gonna stop try to put some effort to whatever the, the fraud is here to stop it and to make sure we have uh, open and fair elections. And it's electing good people. It's recruiting good people, conservatives that have nothing to gain from the system. And until we get back to that and start going to precinct meetings, start recruiting candidates, start getting with state reps and saying uh, we don't want tax increases this year, we want decreases because businesses have had trouble. Uh, that's how we're going to get active. It's we the people. We the people have to get our voice. And I'm excited because uh, I think we're doing that. I think we've had an example of a socialist radical agenda that this president and his cronies under Pelosi and Schumer are promoting, and we've got to stop it. So, you know, how do we do it? Uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to do whatever I can to elect good candidates to get the five, the six congressional members elected that will take the gavel away from Ms. Pelosi. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Congressman. Thanks so much, Bill. Great question. Thanks for joining our conversation. All right. We have Jerry up next before Marilyn. Jerry in Rock Hill, you are live right now. Please go ahead with your question. Ralph, this is Jerry. How you doing? Hey, Mr. Gunnison. How are you, buddy? I'm doing fine. How's Kathy Rose? Doing all right? She's great. She's on the line listening as we speak. Good. Listen, the reason I'm calling, and I haven't heard anybody say anything about our veterans and medical care. Uh, I'm pro medical care for the veterans, and I think it should be made easier for the veterans to obtain medical care. Right now, you have to go up a chain of command, and it's terrible. If you live in Rock Hill and have a problem, they want to send you to Columbia, which is 75 miles away. But they do have something called community care, but you, it takes an act of, excuse me, an act of Congress to uh, get that. I'd like to see the VA medical care just like Medicare uh, and run it like you know the uh, VA does. Ten percent, you get a small portion, 50%, you get a larger portion, 100%, you get more portions. Uh, I I think that our veterans should be protected. That's what I'm after. Jerry, I agree 100% with you. And one thing under the Trump administration, he put veterans first. Now, is it perfect? No. But uh, all I can say is, Jerry, on, and I agree with everything you said, I have no hope that under the president administration that uh, it's, it's going to improve. If anything, I think it will it will get worse, unfortunately. But Kathy Rose does a tremendous job of taking specific needs of our vets, 
and uh and and yes going having to go to dorn uh has been out of the way and is not right but all i suggest is you know we, we do the best we can and call Kathy Rose 803-327-1114 on specific problems overall problems it's just going to take uh like osmosis it just takes time but our veterans come at the top of the list that they gave for our country and we ought to give back to them Kathy Rose, you have anything to add? Hey, Jerry, good evening. Um, I am in total agreement with everything you've said, and I do wish the VA medical care was up to par um, with the Medicare that other citizens um, in the United States get. You know, we strive every day to make sure that our veterans are receiving the proper medical care in a very timely manner. Um, You know all too well how tough it is sometimes to go through the many layers you described, but I can assure you that Congressman Norman fights all the time for better VA care for all veterans in the United States. Excellent, thank you both so much. Love it. Couldn't have said it better myself again, Terry. That phone number is 803-327-1114. That goes for Terry and anyone else who wants to call us at the office. All right, let's get married.